we put these lectures on YouTube also, so if, if, if there's no sound, uh, people are going to be very unhappy. <laughs> so, uh, so why is it that, you know, in the case of Tripsil, you, you keep it at 400 degrees C and um, you, you don't get any carbides. So, well, so remember, first of all, um, you start with the intercritical annealing, right? So 0.2% and you do intercritical annealing. And the way you do it with uh, trip steels is you anneal at a higher temperature than uh, uh, dual phase steels uh, in order to get more uh, austenite. Hmm? So you get this austenite content, okay? And you cool down to, so you go like this, 0.2%, this. And then the, the, the gamma phase you have at high temperature has 0.3, I think I have to look uh, at the phase, let's have uh, the phase diagrams on the screen, that will be helpful. I don't know why it doesn't do this. There we go. There we go. So, okay. So about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 carbon. And of course, if I would uh, cool this down at this time, uh, I would uh, go to the MS temperature and go to the MF temperature also, and I would basically get a dual phase microstructure with 50% of martensite. Okay, but that's not what we do. We keep the temperature at this point, yeah? Okay, and at, so that's about 400 degrees C, typically. Mm? And so there we, this austenite will undergo a bainitic transformation. And it's a bainitic transformation that uh, does not include carbide formation. Yes? And the reason why is the presence of silicon. And remember when we did the introductory lectures, I said silicon suppresses carbide formation and there are reasons for that. Um, uh, you can, uh, uh, the number of reasons, but you can pretty much explain it by saying that, well, um, there are two reasons. It's first, the silicon is not soluble in the cementite and the second reason is the silicon has increases the activity of carbon in ferrite. Okay, so anyway, um, let's just say we know that silicon suppresses carbide formation. So what happens then is instead of staying here, the carbon content will, during the transformation, will increase, yes, to a specific point, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said that point is the T0 point, okay? T0 point, uh, T0 point, yeah. uh, giving you a carbon content that's uh, more than 1%, and so the austenite that you have at that uh, time, which is very enriched in carbon, 
will, will have an MS temperature below room temperature. So when you cool down, nothing happens. It doesn't transform. Okay. All right. So um, wh wh why does this happen? Well, you have to remember that the phase diagram, yes, behind the phase diagram, hmm, there is something else. There is a... Uh, there is a thermodynamic, uh, there, uh, there are thermodynamic, let's put it this way, thermodynamic functions, yes? And these thermodynamic functions are basically uh, related to the stability of the phases that can occur in that system. Hmm? Um, so in this case, in this particular case, during the Bainite transformation, I have two phases. I have ferrite and I have austenite. Hmm? Okay. Um, the f the f and the, st the stability of a phase is determined by its free energy. Hmm? And, and uh, that's one thing. And then the other thing you need to know is that um, if a uh, free energy is, is low, it means that the phase is more stable. And the lower it is, it's uh, even uh, more stable. And if you have two phases and the system has to decide what to do, it will choose the lower phase, the lower um, uh, free energy state. So uh, for, for any phase, the, um, uh, the free energy is a function of two parameters, the temperature yes, and the composition. Right, so you have many elements. Yeah, so okay. Okay. So at a particular temperature at 400 degrees C, that means it will have a free energy for the ferrite phase and for the austenite phase. Yes, that will depend on the composition. Yes. And it looks like, uh, you know, you can calculate this, but it basically looks like this, yes? Mm -hmm. And it's a function, so this is the, would be free energies functions, and this is the carbon content, yes? So you have to imagine this, this lies behind this, yes? And so this point here, which we call where the G of gamma and the G of alpha, uh, are um, the same hmm? composition at which they are the same yes um, at 400 degrees C at, that's, at, that's this T0 yeah? at another temperature yes at another temperature um, G being function of T this T0 point will be somewhere else yes but uh, It lies, so uh, you can actually draw this T0 line of phase diagram, yes? It lies here, somewhere like this, yeah? And what you have to imagine, yes, during the um, bainite, carbide-free bainite transformation, is that there is, you're thinking of a phase diagram where there's no carbon. Yes? So there's no carbon. And I'm basically doing, using this material, this, this steel, this, this uh, gamma phase, yeah? bring it at this temperature, yes? And there's no carbide formation, yes? Then the system will want to have this carbon content in the ferrite and this carbon content in the austenite, yes? But it doesn't, yeah? and the reason is uh, the following. So um, uh, we have a carbon content here. That's the original carbon content, yeah? So that would be um, 0.3 to 0.4 carbon. That's this point. So we're here. Okay. So uh, at this stage, we can see that uh, the 
free energy of gamma is larger than the free energy of uh, ferrite, okay? So if I have this gamma phase, yes, I will start to make uh, ferrite, yes? And it's at low temperatures, yes? So it is a, the, the way that the transformation happens in this particular case is benetic transformation. So it works in little steps, you form small units, yes? For small units, yes? And because they're ferrite, ferrite looks a little bit like martensite, but um, uh, finer, if, if I may say, uh, smaller units, yes? Um, and I come to, uh, when I make this uh, unit, there, are, there is strain energy, yes? And it kind of stops, yeah? Um, what happens then is the carbon content when, yes, the, the carbon will leave this ferrite, yes? It will not form carbides. Again, it's essential that there is enough silicon so that carbides are not formed, because yeah? otherwise you will get standard bainite. So the carbon is expelled, yes? And you go into austenite, yes? and goes into the surrounding austenite. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So now, instead of having um, uh, this 0 0.3, 0 0.4 carbon here, yes, I have slightly higher carbon, yes. So I, I, I have this austenite, yes. And again, uh, the free energy of this austenite is larger than the of ferrite, yes? And so I can fo continue to form ferrite. And ferrite will expel carbon, yeah? So this will go on, this will go on, and progressively the austenite will increase in carbon, yes? Eventually, you'll reach this T0 point in composition. Yeah? Okay. So can you go beyond this point? Yeah, can you go beyond this point? Can you increase the carbon content further? And there, no. No, why? Because if you would do this, yes, the austenite is more stable than the ferrite. So, so it stops here. Yes? So the, the austenite doesn't transform fully to, to be, uh, ferrite, um, or, or to bainitic ferrite, rather, hmm? uh, because it, it just keeps on getting the carbon uh, from the, um, uh, the transforming ferrite. All right. Again, you get this, this huge um, uh, amount of um, carbon in, this, in the austenite, and it's retained. How much, how much, aust of course, because during the bainite transformation, of course, I start with this gamma, intercritically annealed gamma, and I go to uh, a retained gamma plus bainitic ferrite. Huh? So there, this will go into a structure where I will have, as I showed you, Right. You have a benetic ferrite, and then in between, you have retained austenite. Yeah? How much is left? Right? How much volume percent of retained austenite can you expect? Well, anywhere, depending on the carbon content and the composition, of course, 10 to 15 percent. Yeah? Okay. So, um, so we now have a microstructure which looks schematically like this. So I have ferrite, uh, here, okay. I have ferrite, alpha, I have bainitic ferrite, alpha B, yes, and I have austenite. Okay. Okay, and how, why is this helpful to have this uh, austenite in the microstructure? Yeah. Okay. Well, 
what you want to happen is that the um, in the austenite yes in the austenite when I apply stress and the material deforms yes I want to have this austenite transform to martensite yes and I want it to happen by what is called strain induced transformation deformation induced transformation what is deformation induced transformation it means that first the austenite creates dislocations yes yes and these dislocations these dislocation interactions create nuclei for martensite yes and the more I strain the more I create new uh, nuclei for martensite and what happens every time austenite is transformed to martensite it's replaced by a much stronger phase that's point number one. and second a phase that has a larger that takes in a larger volume than the phase it replaces yeah so suppression of necking when you suppress necking it means you have higher uniform elongation or in other words you have more strain hardening yes and that's perfect thing for any material yes because you extend plasticity and at the same time you increase the strength okay now it's a very tricky uh, thing to achieve this strain induced plasticity and I just want to say a few words about this yes so when, I mean, you know from your undergraduate classes in ferrous metallurgy or material science that if this is a temperature scale, yes, and if I have some kind of austenite, yes, there is this temperature which we call MS, yes. Take austenite. I quench it to below MS. What do I get? I get martensite. Yeah? And that, but there are many other ways you can make martensite with the same material, yeah? with the same phase. This martensite is called athermal martensite. Yes, athermal martensite. It's formed because the driving force thermodynamic driving force for to transform for transformation to ferrite has become very high yes and you can show that in many steels this uh, transformation is not time dependent and that's why we call it a thermal and don't ask me to explain it because I, I think it's a very silly name because it should it should not be a thermal it should be time independent or whatever but anyway it's called a thermal martensite um, good however in the case of austenite at room temperature um, there is also an MS sigma temperature yes and there's also an MD temperature yes that define martensite transformation yes first of all let's do MD temperature yes MD temperature is a temperature above which whatever you do to the austenite in terms of deformation or uh, adding stresses yes it will never transform yeah so above MD yes austenite is stable yes So I ask you a question. In, for stainless steels, for instance, austenitic stainless steels, what is really important? The MS temperature or the MD temperature? MD temperature is much more important. 
because you have austenite at room temperature, yes? You have a very low MS temperature, but what happens when you deform the austenite and you don't want martensite to occur? Then MD is very important. You have to make sure that MD hmm, is lower than room temperature. Hmm? So it, you don't get martensite. In this case, we want martensite, yes? And we want martensite during deformation. Yes? We don't want martensite when we apply just stress. Yeah? Right? And this is the, this MS temperature. The MS temperature is the temperature that defines the range where you have stress-induced martensite yes? and the range where you have strain-induced martensite. And for trip steels, you want to have room temperature has to be in this range of. Yeah. What is stress induced martensite? Yeah. Well, it's very simple. When you have a phase, I just told you that the free energy of a phase is a function of temperature and composition, well, it's also influenced by stress, right? Because when I, do, I apply a stress, elastic stress, on the material, I add energy, yeah? So if this is G as a function of T for, a con for composition constant, yeah? Single composition, yeah? Then I have something like this, yeah? And uh, say this would be the free energy of gamma. If I add stress plus stress, elastic stress, yeah, then free energy goes up. Hmm? And uh, remember, higher free energy means less stability. Hmm? Okay. So I make it easier uh, for the material to transform. And there's no deformation involved. No plastic deformation, only elastic deformation. So that means if I if I deform a material here, I stress it elastically, kaboom, I get martensite. Okay? I don't want this. I want this the, the strengthening of the material and the expansion of the material to happen when I'm doing the deformation. For instance, when I do press, press, pressing, or when I uh, the, uh, uh, Typically, when I do deformations, yes, I want to have the, the, the strength increase there. So I want to have a room temperature in this range where you have strain-assisted transformation. Okay? Right, so um, what are the important elements? Again, the composition of these steels, very, very, uh, uh, what we, we say, lean. They're not, you know, not many elements, yes? And so the main element uh, is carbon. It's slightly higher than in the case of uh, DP steel, so between 0.1 and 0.2. It will have an impact on the phase distribution, on the retained austenite stability. It will also be the, the main hardening element for martensite when I make the martensite. Um, and then it may have some imp impacts uh, if I have plate type martensite, it w may reduce the, the, um, the toughness. Mm. And of course, because I have a relatively high uh, carbon content, it may also impact the, it does impact the carbon equivalent and have an impact on the weldability of these materials. But that's not a very, um, uh, uh, very big issue if, um, you take care of um, doing the right, um, selecting the right welding condition. The manganese is an austenite stabilizer here, yes? It strengthens the ferrite, it suppresses perlite formation, those are the main things. And here, uh, very important for uh, TRIP is the addition of silicon, aluminum, and phosphorus, and in particular silicon, yes? Um, in contrast to the DP steels, here you add uh, silicon to suppress cementite formation. Yes, aluminum and phosphorus do this have also this effect. Hmm? 
you can also use aluminum and phosphorus to suppress cementite formation. They're all ferrite stabilizer. They accelerate uh, ferrite formation, increase the activity of carbon. Mm -hmm. They're also very uh, good at strengthening ferrite. Um, and there may be some additions of chrome and moly uh, sometimes, but to su suppress perlite uh, formation, but uh, not uh, commonly uh, added to uh, cold rolled uh, trip steels. Now, um, can we make trip steels uh, via uh, hot rolling? Yes, no problem. Uh, so this here, this diagram here, holds for cold rolled, yes, cold rolled, where the starting material here would is cold rolled trip steel, yeah, um, and, and you do, and, and when you start uh, to process the material and you can, the, the microstructure, the initial microstructure is ferrite plus perlite, yeah, no reason to make uh, to start with a, a, a trip steel microstructure. Yeah? So you, you do intercritical annealing and then the bainite transformation in your continuous uh, annealing line. When you make a, a trip steel in a hot strip mill, so you again, you start from your austenite, which comes out of the uh, tandem finishing mill, at around uh, 800 to 900 degrees C. And then you keep the temperatures constant. And you do this to make ferrite, yes? And uh, enrich the, the austenite in carbon mm -hmm. during the pro-eutectoid ferrite transformation, yes? And then you cool down to the coiling temperature, yes? In this case, the coiling temperature is above the MS temperature, yeah, above the MS temperature, and um, so you do the uh, the transformation of uh, uh, so the uh, here this austenite here transforms to retained austenite plus bainite, yes, at 400 degrees C. What happens when I'm making the retained austenite, yes, uh, at this stage, is the MS temperature decreases, of course, yes, because I enrich, I, I, the, the, the carbon content in the austenite goes from 0.4 to 1.2. So, so gradually, there is a decrease in the MS temperature. Yeah? And you do this, the, the bainite transformation in the, the coil, the coiled material, yeah? and you get, uh, and then when you go to room temperature, of course, to room temperature, you're above the MS temperature and you don't have um, a um, martensite formation. You're left with retained austenite, okay? Okay, so this is the same for th which I just explained. When you do continuous annealing, uh, this is the retain the, the intercritical uh, austenite, so you have to cool it fast enough to 400 degrees C, so you avoid uh, ferrite formation. Yes, when you do the bainite transformation, yes, it'll start here. The MS temperature starts to drop because I add carbon to the austenite during the bainite transformation, and the bainite transformation stops when the transformation is incomplete, okay? when you've reached the T0 line, yeah? Okay? And then you can cool down because the MS temperature is very much lower than room temperature, okay? So again, if we look at the, uh, uh, the structure originally will consist of ferrite, ferritic bainite, yes, and retained austenite. Yes, and that's the residual austenite, okay? And you can see uh, residual austenite strength is less than 600 megapascal yield strength, yeah? And these are the strength values for contribution to strength of bainite 
and the contributions to the strength of ferrite. Yeah? And you can see, for instance, well, bainite is a little bit stronger than, uh, than ferrite because it's got lots more dislocations in it, transformation dislocation, and it's got um, a smaller lat size than the, gr the grain size, etc. cetera. So, um, but it's, it's, it's not uh, hugely uh, very strong, uh, very much stronger than, uh, than regular ferrite. So what happens is then when you trend this residual austenite is this changed into martensite during the transformation, yes? And it's a high carbon martensite, 1.2% of carbon. So you're looking at uh, 2,500 megapascal, so uh, increase in local strength, yes? So our trips, when, when we have a trip effect, yes? The material, which without the trip effect would be, um, uh, for this particular example here, uh, 680 megapascal. The deformation, which gives me the transformation to martensite, gives me a material with the strength increase close to 900 megapascal. Hmm? Of course, you don't get this huge amount of, of strengthening. Why? Because it's the, the retained also is only 10% of the microstructure, right? So, so uh, you, you will have an increase of about uh, 250 uh, megapascal at best. Okay, so that's that's about what what we calculate here. So, very important here is the fact that uh, the strain hardening, yes, when we strain harden, uh, for instance, a high strength IF steel, yes, what we see is that, uh, so you have the strain hardening, yes, as after 5% of deformation, yes, the end value reaches a maximum, yes, of about 0.22, yes, okay? And then you've got a continuous decreasing of the end value, yeah? If you do the same thing for the uh, the trip steel, for trip steel, you see that you have a sustained strain hardening, yes? And can reach up to value 0.3 before you get a, a reduction, yes? And so um, the line where the, uh, the, the, the strain, yes, is equal to this uh, derivative here, yes? Uh, the... Um, um, this is called the instantaneous uh, strain hardening, yes. You can see where they uh, intersect. That gives me the uniform elongation. So I see an increase in uniform elongation, yes, as a result of this trip effect. The trip effect, yeah, uh, you have to be aware of this, yes, is whether or not it works, how well it works, depends very much on the steel you have. Yeah? So the, 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 the choice of the chemistry of a steel, yes, of a trip steel, uh, depends on what you want. So first, we already discussed it. We, we said, well, we want to have strain-induced uh, martensite. Yeah? Um, and we want the transformation has to be spread over the, defo the, the, the deformation path. Yeah? So we, d we don't want to have a lot of uh, transformation very early on in the deformation or very late in the deformation. Yeah? So for instance, uh, you can see here this the kinetics, the amount of Bartonsite transformation as a function of strain. And you see different types of trip steels and you see for instance, trip steels, which only have silicon, yes, they transform relatively early, yes, in the strain. Uh, trip steels where you have replaced part of the silicon with aluminum and phosphorus have a much um, more uh, spread out uh, deformation, uh, sorry, uh, transformation kinetics. 
So we, we won't get to uh, this diagram and uh, it's a little bit too, uh, too much detailed, yes. So, but let's have a look at some uh, trip grades here. Hmm? So um, uh, you, you're looking at materials which, which can easily achieve uh, close to um, 700 or 800 uh, megapascal in tensile strength and have reasonable elongations, minimum of 23%. Yeah? And also, uh, they turn out to be pretty good in terms of bake hardening. Yes. Okay. So, is there anything we can uh, we can do to uh, uh, build on this kind of uh, alloy system? Well, yes. Um, why not? If the Bainite transformation gives me so much strength, why not forget about the ferrite phase altogether and make a bainitic steel, entirely bainitic, with some retained austenite? Yes? Well, these steels exist, yeah? and we call them bainitic steels. That's not... Uh, yeah? And so, uh, for instance, if you do look at the hot-rolled fully bainitic steel, yeah? so in the hot-rolling... Uh, in, in the line, in the hot strip mill, you hot roll the material, and then you cool down quickly. Yes, you, you don't need to make ferrite. Yes, you cool down quickly to the bainite transformation temperature. Yes, in the coil, and during this transformation, yes, the MS temperature will decrease because I'm enriching uh, uh, austenite with uh, carbon, and then when I cool down, I get carbon-free bainite, yes? And it's stronger than the ferrite. I can also make a ferrite bainite steel, yes? Where I control uh, the amount of ferrite, yes? So, for instance, uh, here, it's, it's, and it's very similar to uh, what you would make in a um, in a steel, uh, a, a um, trip steel, except it's got more uh, bainite in it. Hmm. So after the hot rolling, I do a ferrite transformation, yes, and then a bainite transformation. Hmm. Okay, this is an example here of one of these ferrite bainite steels you see very, very fine, this is 10 microns, yes? Remember that in HSLA steels, uh, our grain size is, um, is less than 10 microns, but more than five microns, right? And you can see that much of this uh, microstructure, the ferrite is even is smaller, yes? So I have very, uh, in these ferrite, Bainite uh, structure, I have a very fine uh, ferrite. One of the reasons why we're interested in this very fine microstructure is, is formability. It turns out that in trip steels and in DP steels, because we form, because it, uh, in comparison to ferrite bainite street, uh, steels, the microstructure is a little bit coarser Yes, the performance of these materials in a uh, test called hole expansion, where you basically um, have a pressed part which has a hole, and when you press it again, the hole expands. Yes, um, we see that trip steels and dual phase steels will crack at an earlier stage than the ferrite bainite steels. That's one of, one of the reasons why ferrite bainite steels um, are being used in certain uh, applications. Mm -hmm. This is an example here of a ferrite bainite steel. One of the things you'll see here is um, the steel looks 
a little bit like a trip steel in terms of the um, uh, processing, but very important, it's, it's, it's a low carbon, low carbon uh, steel. And the other thing is the refinement that you get from of the ferrite, yes, is actually d due to micro-alloying, okay? Good. Um, here's some properties for the 600 uh, megapascal. Uh, very large uh, total elongations, yes. This is an example of a complex face uh, steel grade. It's, these are uh, higher, st actually uh, very similar to uh, ferrite um, uh, bainite steels, but th the microstructure is a bit more complex in the sense that in addition to small ferrite grain size, and bainite, it also contains martensite and retained austenite. Okay? This is an example here of a 900, and, and because there is martensite and retained austenite, certainly the martensite, you get larger uh, strengths. Okay, Ni close to 900 megapascal. Complex phase or CP grades, also called. And, uh, and they are all already standardized, these, uh, up to uh, 980 megapascal. Hmm? Nowadays, um, this trend to, uh, to go beyond the uh, 980 megapascals, to go beyond the gigapascals, uh, has resulted in the development of grades which are ultra high strength, so that which are more than a thousand megapascal, uh, 1500, and there's a lot of active research in the development of 2000 megapascal uh, uh, grades uh, that can in some way be formed. One of the ways, uh, very creative ways, uh, in which you can uh, increase the strength is by uh, quench hardening uh, or uh, and, and using press hardening steels. So the idea here is to say um, if we have an ultra high strength steel, more than a gigapascal you know, of strength, it becomes increasingly hard to press these materials. Yes, obviously you have a one gigapascal material, press this, you, you, you need more power in your press. Mm -hmm. You'll uh, damage your presses much more. Be, uh, the forces will be higher. And what's more, there is this a phenomenon called elastic spring back. Mm -hmm. So you press the part that's very high strength. When you do this, <coughs> you generate very high internal stresses. And the part, when you remove the, the dyes, the, the, the part literally springs back. Yeah? And this can lead to curvature of the part. It can le lead to um, all kinds of problem related to the dimensions of the parts. Yeah? And dimension control for instance, automotive industry is extremely important. You, you know, I mean, you cannot have, I mean, when, when you make a part, it's got to have exact uh, dimensions, yes? So if there is some elastic distortion due to spring back, um, you know, you, you will have to do, you know, it's a big headache, basically. Yeah. So one of the ways you can uh, solve this is uh, press hardening steels or quench hardening steels, yes? You, Take the material, you make blanks, yes. Uh, you form a blank, it's a trimming press, and then you heat the material. You heat the material. And what the, how does this material look like originally? Well, it's, it looks very simple, ferrite bite microstructure. Hmm? So, uh, and the property of the starting microstructure are here. Hmm? Less than 600 megapascal, 
elongation about 20. Yes. We heat it up, however, yes, to 900 degrees C. We austenitize it, in other words. So this microstructure turns into homogeneous austenite. Yes. And then, so that's in the heating furnace. And then we do, we press form it. We press form this austenite but we press form it in water-cooled dyes. Yeah. So what happens? You bring the material in, you press form austenite. Yes, as you continue holding it in the press, the material will start cooling down. Yes, and the, 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 the cooling rate is pretty uh, high, yes, and you are going to make martensite. Yeah. So this structure is turned into this structure. Yeah. And you know, of course, that the, 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 this is a lath martensite. Depending on the carbon content, I can get anywhere from 1,200 megapascal to 1,500 megapascal, and even beyond there. Yeah. So you, okay, so to make this so, so here, the, the properties at 900 are, are very soft. You, the material has, um, you know, tensile strength is less than 300, and the elongation is fabulous, right? 50, 40 to 50. So no problems to uh, uh, turn this into austenite at high temperature, and then turn that into martensite, lath martensite, at room temperature um, in your... Uh, um, that. What this, um, this material here, we use, uh, so for uh, press hardening steel, we use a material that contains, uh, that's um, carbon, manganese, and boron steel, yes? Why do we add boron? Well, to make the steel hardenable, yes? To suppress ferrite formation. Mm -hmm. Another important point about this steel is that because you want to have boron um, effectively working as a uh, hardenability agent, you add titanium. Titanium, because titanium forms titanium nitride, yes, and there is no boron nitride formation. Because that's one of the problems, and we've discussed this uh, in the past, is that when you have um, uh, boron, you add boron to a steel, it will usually scavenge, that is, bind uh, with nitrogen, yes, instead of uh, staying in solution. And this can be avoided by addition of titanium, which um, then protects, as it were, the uh, boron additions you've made. There are uh, more and interesting developments in the direction of uh, making formable uh, high and ultra high uh, carbon uh, steels. One of the um, interesting concepts that is being uh, developed, uh, that's been developed in the past couple of years is what's called uh, quench and partitioning steel Q and P steels, Q and P processing of steel involves the following idea. And again, you can uh, carry this out in a continuous annealing line if uh, it's equipped for it. So what, what you do, the idea is a clever idea and it's also based on the idea of trying to introduce retained austenite in a microstructure, and in particular in the martensitic microstructure. Because when I quench from high temperature 
to low temperature, I just make lath martensite. Carbon is in a su supersaturated solution. And, um, and I don't have the trip effect, or I don't have a trip effect, a plasticity enhancing mechanism. <clears throat> so let's look at what this quenching partitioning involves. Well, uh, so you austenitize your material. And so first step is quenching. Okay. And now the clever thing is uh, in this uh, processing is that you stop in the MSMF range. So you stop here. Yes. Because the transformation is athermal, yes, the temperature at which you choose to do the transformation, yes, will be the temperature will also define the amount of austenite you have. Yeah? So I have, if I stop here, I quench here, I will have some martensite and some retained austenite. Okay? Okay. Okay, so now what's the next step is you reheat this microstructure. And what happens is this here, the martensite, which is supersaturated in carbon, will now transfer the carbon into the adjacent austenite. Yes? Okay. And when this happens, of course, the MS temperature will drop. Yeah? It will drop. So that when I cool down, yes, some of this retained austenite, so some of so this, see, this austenite here, right? Some of this austenite here, yes, will be retained. Yes, it so will not fully transform to martensite. And I'm left with a microstructure that's martensitic with pockets of retained austenite. Now, you, you may ask yourself, well, you know, uh, doesn't it take long times and everything? Well, no, it's actually, the, you can actually, uh, the, the transfer of the carbon uh, from the martensite to the adjacent austenite happens very quickly. We're talking about a matter of seconds. Yeah? And the reason why is uh, because uh, in this partially martensitic microstructure, you have very small diffusion distances. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for instance, here, if you look here, you have a, a small lath of martensite. Yes? And this is austenite here. And you look at how long does it take to have almost, f you know, a lot of carbon transfer from the lath to the austenite. And you see here, after five seconds, uh, 10 seconds, 100 seconds here, yes, a lot of the carbon is already in the austenite. Yeah? Over distances of the order of... Um, a tenth to two tenths of a micron, and that's enough. Mm -hmm. You see here, for instance, after uh, 500 seconds, it's less than 10 minutes. This is the profile of the carbon in the austenite, yeah? And the, and the original profile starts, of course, with with this. Hmm? So you can see most of the carbon is just quickly. So, and at uh, 100 seconds, you're already here. Yeah? So, and that, that's about two minutes. Yeah? So very quickly, you get um, the transfer of the carbon into the adjacent austenite. Now you can uh, calculate, uh, again, um, when, when you make uh, complex microstructures like this, uh, things are more, the physical metallurgy is more complex, and, um, and it turns out that there is an optimum temperature at which you should quench, yes? And uh, typically, it's for carbon steels, it's around 200 to 300 degrees C, and how much 
what is the maximum amount of retained austenite you can achieve? Well, around 20% of the volume, yes? So, and the chemistry of these steels, not very complex, again, yeah? Um, low carbon here, this is typical composition. Low carbon, some uh, silicon uh, very often because you, you kind of want to, again, suppress carbide formation, yes? And, um, and the properties are, uh, are good here. You see here QNP processed materials have the same strength range as martensitic steels, except you have larger total elongations. Yeah? And again, uh, I remind you of the fact that these are the ultra high strength grades, right? So, uh, Quench and partitioning offers you a lot of strength and um, uh, elongations, formability that's better than the equivalent purely martensitic, lat martensitic uh, steels. Okay? Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, steel industry has discovered that. Uh, working on microstructures can be uh, very rewarding in terms of properties, yes? Instead of just focusing on chemistry and chemical compositions like the carbon content or manganese, yes? Um, content and uh, the new steels are coming into consideration. One of them is twip steels, yes? Um, and uh, these twip steels are austenitic steels. They're not more ferritic steels. They're uh, austenitic steels, and um, you can see here what happens in a twip steel is as you uh, strain the material, you're looking here at a, a grain in the material, yes? It's got some annealing twins, yes? Uh, which are normal in austenitic uh, steels. But when I strain it and I, I look at the grain, I can see these very sharp lines slip lines appearing and more I strain the more the grain is divided and subdivided in tinier and tinier uh, um, patches uh, surrounded by twins hmm? okay and so and you can see this in uh, in TM very much as uh, uh, so what we see is that uh, no strain we see a lot of stacking faults in the material. When we start straining, we, uh, we, we see uh, dislocations being formed, yes? In addition to more of these stacking faults, yes? And eventually at around, say, 10%, when you look at the microstructure, the entire microstructure is full of these very thin twins, yes? So what happens in a normal microstructure the dislocation, say you have dislocation source here, dislocation loops are generated during plastic deformation, yes, um, and, and they run into um, grain boundaries and things like this and you get strengthening. In the case of, so, so the, the mean free path, the mean free path that dislocations can travel will typically be of the order of the grain size. And we know that making grain sizes smaller gives me strength, right? So when you have what's called deformation twinning, this phenomenon uh, that I just explained, that as you strain the material, I form twins, yes? Deformation twin, the microstructure will gradually be divided in smaller and smaller dimensions. So the dislocations will have smaller and smaller mean free paths. It's as if I had a dynamic hull patch effect. Yes, I would strain the material and the grain size would get smaller and smaller. Yeah, so the tensile strength gets higher and higher. Yeah. So that is the mechanism of strain hardening in these um, twip steels. Okay. And again, as I said, and I'm going to, to stop here with these new types of developments. Um, 
uh, yes, and what is interesting, of course, is that thanks to the, the modern processing technology, we can do, make these things. Yes. In the past, it was much more harder because, you, for instance, you had only batch annealing. Nowadays, you can do continuous annealing and you can actually do quite complex uh, thermal treatments, which allow you to make these microstructures um, in a relatively um, simple way, in a reproducible way, and using steels that are not highly alloyed or, you know, in terms of compositions, are relatively simple. Okay. Right, let me uh, introduce the subject we will be discussing, starting to discuss next week. Well, no, excuse me, not next week, uh, Thursday. So if, I, if I'm correct, there is a uh, voting day on Wednesday tomorrow and on Friday's Memorial Day, right? So, and then there are no classes on these days from what I understand. However, it's not holiday for us because we're meeting on Thursday, okay? So we will have an, I'm sorry to say, a quiz on Thursday, okay? But let me introduce the, the um, so, the, so the way we'll, we'll work is we'll do bar and wire products um, after the, the strip products, and then we'll go into uh, long products, and then plate, um, if we have enough time. So, um, well, this is one of these uh, very famous uh, uh, products from this category, is rebar, yes, uh, that's used for uh, construction reinforcing uh, uh, cement construction, yes. Um, we will um, talk about uh, a lot, oops, about wire and rod. Go back here. Um, and in particular, we'll, we'll get lots of attention to wire and rod uh, and, and five products groups. Uh, namely rebar, tire cord, cold heading quality steels, spring steels and bearing steels in addition to free cutting or free machining steels. Yeah? And we'll discuss uh, the, the concepts behind the, the steels um, and the, the compositions and the processing mm -hmm. um, and explain you know, why, why certain choices are made because of the application. Okay. So, how does this compare to the product we discussed? Uh, we just finished discussing the hot rolled and cold rolled products. Yeah? Well, for instance, for a company like uh, POSCO, yes, uh, in 2007, you see that cold rolled and hot rolled products are very, very uh, uh, strongly represented. Yes. Uh, POSCO is also a big uh, plate producer, um, but you can see here that uh, wire rod uh, products are also very important, yes, um, industrially. And so that's why we will be uh, talking about them. The start of uh, wire rod uh, and uh, bar uh, starts in a wire rod and uh, before the wire rod and bar mill in a continuous casting facility, yes, usually combined with electrical uh, furnace to make steels, but uh, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if you have an integrated mill, uh, some of the, the steels can come from um, uh, BOF. You, but anyway, you can you, you use in this technologies for wire and, and uh, rods and bar, you use continuous casting. Yes, uh, of course you don't use slabs, but you use uh, multi-strand casters. Here you, you're lo looking at uh, square billets, and um, I don't know one, two, three, about six here, six strands of casting material. 
very important in uh, this type of steels is the internal uh, cleanliness of the steels. Yes. So uh, you can see this here. Uh, this is uh, the uh, fatigue uh, life, as it were, uh, for wire, yes, as a function of the oxygen content in the steel. And the oxygen content you have to see as a measure for the content of uh, uh, non-metallic inclusions, oxides typically. So you can see that as we reduce the oxygen content, yes, we have a tremendous increase, because it's a log scale, in the number of cycles these wires will survive. Yes? And the trend is towards the use of you know, vacuum treatments, use of uh, the control of these non-metallic inclusions. Very often when these wires break, what, what people actually find is a non-metallic inclusions that causes the, the fracture. Yeah? And, um, and because you have uh, wires, yes, the impact of a one small uh, inclusion is very important. And the sheet, uh, 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 an inclusion, is, you know, is, the effect can, is diluted. But in a wire, it's not. You know, even if there is only one, that's where it will break. Yes, so um, very important here, and it does have influence on the metallurgy. Uh, you know, for instance, in certain applications like spring steels, where uh, uh, you do f fatigue the material during its life, yes, um, you you will avoid uh, using aluminum killed steels. You will uh, specify silicon killed steels to make sure uh, this type of uh, non-metallic inclusions, uh, lumina uh, type non-metallic inclusions, um, interfere with the, uh, or reduce the fatigue life. Okay, but we'll talk about this on Thursday after you've voted tomorrow for the party of your choice. Thank you very much. <laughs>